On January 21st of 2005, four teenagers piled into a red geo prism and peeled out of the school parking lot to get some Taco Bell. Sounds like a good time amongst young friends, doesn't it? But a palpable mixture of unease, tension, and forced pleasantries hung in the air as only one of these teens actually believed they were going there for lunch. An elderly couple eating at the restaurant noticed a tattered red car pull into a parking space and right away they could tell that an argument had ensued between the two girls in the front seat. Teenagers. Unstable little humans driven by hormones. So they turned away to mind their own business even when the car began to shudder violently. Little did they know that just a few months down the line they would find themselves sitting in a cold courtroom testifying about what they witnessed that day because what happened in that little red car would make anyone beg for that peaceful sleep that is death. My name is Killian and welcome to True Crime Stories. In 2004, Sarah Cole was just a girl struggling with her identity, just like most of us at 16 years old. She chose to express herself through multiple face piercings, wild hair, gothic attire, a fierce disposition, and last but not least, a juggalo. For those unfamiliar with the term, a juggalo is a fan of the rap group Insane Clown Posse or any other hip-hop group signed by Psychopathic Records. Juggalos have their own distinct idioms, slang, and traits. Sarah's outward differences set her apart from her peers, perhaps because she struggled with her inner differences, and that although she was attracted to boys, she was attracted to girls as well. Her closest friend was a boy named Corey Gregory, with whom she had a short relationship with, but would soon relegate him to the friend zone. He was described as shy and soft-spoken, and always can be seen following Sarah around, like a dog, in hopes that his unwavering obedience would win her over once again. He too was a juggalo, even before he knew Sarah, so when he learned that she was a juggalo, he thought it was a match made in clown heaven. But Corey had his own inner demons to ward off, but we'll touch on that later. Sarah, regardless of her differences, made up for it with her affinity for making people feel welcomed. This made her a very popular person amongst other students, so when a new and attractive girl was wandering around campus, she made sure to make her feel right at home. And this new girl's name was Adrienne Reynolds, and the two hit it off immediately, becoming fast friends. But unbeknownst to Sarah at the time, this new girl came with a troubled past. This union would be the beginning of the end. Adrienne Reynolds, 16, was born to a single mother on September 12th of 1988 in Kilgore, Texas. While she lived with her mom, she still had a positive relationship with her father. However, when he remarried and moved away to Illinois, it affected her deeply, as one could imagine, because kids often wonder why they weren't enough if they were the root cause and even blame themselves for a parent's absence. For Adrienne, it was no different. As a result, her teen angst took control of the wheel and things began spiraling out of control. She was ditching classes to smoke weed, mixing with the wrong crowd, and engaging in promiscuous behavior. Even after attending high school for two years, she had not acquired a single high school credit. Her mom couldn't put up with it anymore and prompted her to move in with her dad, Tony. Fortunately, he and his new wife, Joanne, welcomed her with open arms. But Tony was tough, a straightforward type of guy. He even spent time in prison, which is why he didn't want Adrienne anywhere near that type of lifestyle. He had one rule and one rule only. You live under my roof. You follow my rules. Period. It didn't take long for the cracks to form as Adrienne began to defy them as well, especially her new stepmom. Not wanting to make things worse, 
the pair agreed to attend counseling, and this did help the new family of three understand each other better as they learned that Adrienne loved to sing and even set her sights for American Idol. She also wanted to be a designer and even had aspirations to join the Marines. As a step in the right direction, she enrolls in an outreach program at Black Hawk College to earn her GED and hopefully make up for some lost time. So like I mentioned earlier, Sarah and Adrienne would hit it off effortlessly. But old habits die hard and Adrienne's rebellious train takes off once again. But this time, she was accompanied by Sarah and they find themselves skipping classes and smoking weed. Now let's not forget about Corey who continued to trail Sarah, like he always had. But now, Adrienne was in the picture, and that reduced him to a mere shadow, an afterthought. He and his beloved Sarah used to be inseparable, but she appeared to relish doing the things they used to do together with someone else. And we could only imagine the jealousy that was brewing within Corey when it was obvious to anyone that saw how Sarah behaved around Adrienne that she was falling for her. But his undying loyalty to Sarah kept him by her side regardless. Sarah's pursuit of Adrienne began innocently enough with little handwritten letters back and forth that slowly began to touch upon subjects such as sexuality, the thrill it must have given Sarah to confess she was bisexual, and to have Adrienne respond that she was open to possibilities and labeled herself as simply by curious. One thing led to another, and they were rumored to have a few romantic encounters, but unfortunately, it wouldn't last, which left Sarah heartbroken a bit. But what happens next would change her feelings for Adrienne completely. As hearsay would have it, there was a house where students would go to hook up. Sarah learns that Adrienne had been to that house on a few occasions and had been with at least two different boys. This in itself was more salt on the wound, but it wasn't enough to jeopardize their friendship. But that final straw was just around the corner when Adrienne started developing feelings for Corey, becoming a lot more chummy and it did not go unnoticed. Though Corey was technically single, he was still attached at the hip with Sarah. And when Adrienne finally mustered the courage to pull Corey aside and ask him out, he would immediately tell his juggalo soulmate all about it. To Adrienne, it probably didn't seem like anything significant, but to Sarah, she saw nothing but red, and not for the reasons one would assimilate. Oh no, it was pettier than that. Sarah was simply a petty, petty person. Example, she broke up with Corey, broke his heart, and used his pain to keep him on a string, she didn't give a fuck about Corey, as he'll later come to realize that he merely was a useful minion that gave her all the attention she craved. She simply loves to control the people around her. She needs to be the center of attention. It was why she would say and do the things necessary to make other people like her. It all revolved around control. And for those unfortunate enough to find themselves on her bad side, well, they get to see underneath her mask at the ugly and hostile person she actually was. And now this ungrateful new girl that she went out of her way to introduce to her circle was attempting to fuck with the hierarchy she had established. And while Sarah had always sought attention through manipulation, facade, and intimidation, but Adrienne, on the other hand, was winning people over by simply being a kind-hearted person. And it ate Sarah alive as Adrienne was gradually becoming more popular than her. Fun fact, Sarah's grandfather would later state that during this time, Sarah would dye her hair back to its normal color, remove her body jewelry, and even start bathing again. And could it be in some twisted way that she wanted to be Adrienne? And in another twisted way, was she just trying to look more innocent? But sociopaths will be sociopaths. And Adrienne was about to be reintroduced to Sarah Kolb, the real 
Sarah Cole. From that point on, Adrienne's walks between classes became a verbal assault. She became the subject of Sarah's harsh and demeaning words, treating her as a personal punching bag to vent her rage any chance she could. And Sarah said she hated girls that she deemed easy because she felt like they were disrespecting the female culture. And Sarah could say this because she had more class than that, according to her. And students recall that classy young lady standing in front of the school smoking cigarettes, saying things like, I'm gonna hurt that bitch, which at that point, everyone knew who she was referring to. And of course, Corey was right there to fan the flames because he was glad that it was just him and Sarah again. Gossip about a major fight between Adrienne and Sarah would begin to echo in every corner of the school, but nothing would happen for the remainder of 2004. As a matter of fact, things seemed to have calmed down a bit by the new year, as Sarah was happy to reprise her role as leader of the pack, and Corey, I guess, had come to grips with his unrequited love, but was still at Sarah's beck and call. And even after all this, Adrienne still felt the control Sarah had over her. She had looked up to her and shared her dark past with her. She was riddled with guilt at how their friendship ended, and she knew by Sarah's strict friendship policy that the only way to redeem herself was to take her own life. Adrienne was actually on board with this idea, but her attempt failed, just as she's failed the previous 20 times. The girl was in so much pain. January 21st, 2005. Amidst all the chaos and drama, Adrienne desperately wanted to end the war that she never intended to start. She was scared of Sarah, but hoped to reason with Corey, so she wrote him a note and entrusted it to a boy at school who was her ride home that day. Unfortunately, when he approached the group to hand the letter to Corey, Sarah lunged at him but he managed to pull the letter away. However, Sarah's new service dog, a kid named Sean, grabs the letter, tears it into pieces, and throws it in the air. Later that day, Sarah's ride home mysteriously excused himself from school due to an illness, leaving Adrienne stranded. Was it all part of Sarah's plan? As soon as the lunch bell rang, Adrienne stepped out of class and found Sarah walking menacingly towards her. Sarah cornered her against the wall and pointed a finger at her saying, I'm gonna fucking kill you. Adrienne was paralyzed with fear, but tried to create some space between them while apologizing profusely, trying to get across that she never meant to cause any problems. And eventually, Sarah's aggression began to subside as Adrienne's words seemed to be getting through to her. Corey then joined the party and they offered to give Adrienne a ride home since she had no other means of transportation. Adrienne happily accepted, hoping there was something left of their friendship to salvage. In the school parking lot, Sarah got into her red geo prism. Adrienne took the passenger seat, Corey and Sean in the back. Students remembered the sounds of tires screeching as Sarah drove off. While driving, Sarah would soon suggest, well, it was more of an order since no one says no to Sarah, that they grab some lunch at Taco Bell and resolved their issues over some tacos. She parked the car and turned off the engine, and Sarah took a deep breath, turned to Adrienne, and said, I hear you want to run a train, and all hell would break loose. By 7.30 that night, Adrienne's father had been unsuccessful in finding his daughter. He learned that no one had seen her since leaving the campus for lunch, nor did she work her shift at Checker's restaurant afterwards. Fearing the worst, he called the police. By the following day, detectives had already pieced together Adrienne's timeline and the people she was supposed to be with. First things first, get a hold of Sarah Cobe, Sean, and Corey Gregory to see what their stories were. Corey Gregory probably didn't expect to spend his Saturday with detectives recounting what happened, but there he was and his story went something like this. After they arrived at Taco Bell, Sarah was behind the wheel and there were some heated exchanges between the two girls. However, by the end of lunch, they had reconciled 
and become friends again. Instead of taking Adrienne home, they dropped her off at McDonald's as per her request so that her dad wouldn't see her in a car with boys. Adrienne's father confirmed that the story was plausible since he knew his daughter was aware of how he would react if he found out she was in a car with boys. But then he added that it didn't make a lick of sense because Adrienne knew that he'd be at work. So what's the point? He also knew that Adrienne was not the type to run away, which is usually the initial assumption for detectives when dealing with missing teenagers. Moreover, he emphasized that Adrienne did not even collect her paycheck at Checkers, which he knew for certain she would if she had intended to run away. Next, detectives found themselves staring at a most timid and soft-spoken boy, Sean, but they were most intrigued that his story differed quite a bit from Corey's. Upon arriving at the Taco Bell parking lot, after Sarah said the run the train remark, Sarah grabbed a fistful of Adrienne's hair and began yelling and hitting her. Sean disapproved of the violence, but lacked the courage to physically go against Sarah, so he instead firmly told her to stop. Sarah responded by telling him to fucking leave if he didn't like it, prompting Sean to exit the car and walk back to school. After that, he doesn't know what happens. Sarah Cobe was working at her job at Cinema 53 in Davenport when she received a call from an East Moline detective asking her about Adrienne Reynolds. A co-worker said that she noticed Sarah talking on the phone and watched as the young girl's demeanor completely change. She was visibly shaking. Afterwards, the co-worker asked her if she was okay, but got more than she ever wanted to know. Sarah told her that the police called, asking about her friend that went missing yesterday. She told them about driving her to Taco Bell for lunch and even admitted to a physical altercation in the car, but apologies were had and things were all patched up after lunch. She dropped the girl off at McDonald's and that was the last she saw of her. Sarah then, for whatever reason, leans in and tells her co-worker in confidence that what she told the police were lies. That her friend Corey, who was in love with her, had killed the girl in a jealous rage and she helped him dispose of the body. The co-worker was undoubtedly shocked, but she did remember telling Sarah that if they searched her car and found anything connected to the girl, but couldn't find the girl, that Sarah was screwed. Detectives continued their investigation by talking to students on campus and a couple of stories piqued their interest. A friend of Sarah said that she expressed a lot of anger towards Adrienne, not only that day, but for a while now, saying things like, I'm gonna beat her ass. Another student was even invited to the Taco Bell trip when he said that he couldn't make it, Sarah left him with a cryptic statement of, I'm going to go have fun. Detectives then seized a rather interesting piece of evidence that was required to be kept by students at the school, their personal journal. When they were given Sarah's, more than a few eyebrows raised at the entries leading up to Adrienne's disappearance. They found numerous derogatory remarks and bad blood about the missing person, but the most alarming discovery was her final entry in which she expressed a desire to murder Adrienne Reynolds. But it wouldn't be but three days later that a familiar face stepped into the police station with his parents and wanted to talk to detectives again. It was Corey Gregory, and he was a nervous wreck. His story had now changed considerably. And a quick warning to the squeamish, things are about to get extremely graphic. As soon as they parked, the animosity from Sarah towards Adrienne reached a boiling point. Adrienne, who had come along to mend fences, was caught off guard when Sarah, seeking some twisted revenge, began shouting and striking her in the face. It was at this point Sean exited the car. Adrienne fought back and managed to land a punch on Sarah's nose, which further incensed her because she had paid good money for that nose. Sarah grabbed a wooden stick from under her seat and tries to beat Adrienne into submission. Adrienne is a fighter, so the chaos intensifies and it spills into the back seat with Corey. But Sarah has the upper hand and has a tight grip on Adrienne's throat. The struggle ensues, but she squeezes 
and squeezes harder until the girl eventually passes out. Sarah and Corey exits the car and in broad daylight, after viciously attacking a girl, sat on the hood and had a cigarette together. Afterwards, they went back inside. They noticed that Adrienne had turned blue. She was dead. Detectives felt that Corey was conveniently leaving something out. It was hard for them to believe that he just sat there and watched the love of his life in a death match without the temptation to help. They turned up the heat a bit and guess what? He broke under pressure and his story changed again. So, when Corey saw that wild punch land on Sarah's nose, it riled him up, but he had confidence that Sarah got this. He turns his attention elsewhere and simply gazes out the window. After Sarah grabs the wooden stick and hits her a few times with it, Adrienne escapes to the back seat. Sarah follows and starts strangling her. Corey all the while continues to remain still and continues looking out the window. But eventually, the limp, unconscious body of Adrienne falls onto his lap. She was still breathing. And without much hesitation, he removes the belt from around his waist wraps it around Adrian's neck and finishes the job for his beloved Sarah. They know they have to get rid of the body and Sarah knows exactly how. They drove up to a farm just outside of their city that belonged to her grandparents. By this point, Adrian's body was in the trunk of the car wrapped in a tarp. They take her out and Corey describes the moment for detectives. We pour the gasoline and light her on fire. I poured the gasoline on the tarp. It was a butane lighter. I used the lighter and lit it, and then Sarah and I just stood away, and Sarah laid her head on my shoulder. It must have been a magical moment for Corey. Maybe murder would finally bring them together. But the body didn't burn as they thought it would. It was too cold and the ground was frozen. After a while, they realized it wasn't going to disintegrate as they hoped. They agreed they needed to chop up the body, but these two juggalo clowns could only go as far as beating and strangling an innocent girl to death. But when it came to dismembering, oh come on, they're not savages. So now enter juggalo number three, a 15 year old boy named Nathan Godet, a serial killer in the making it seems. He was known to torture animals and was quite fond of blood and gore. So it wasn't a surprise when he agreed to the task of taking apart a human body. He borrowed a saw from his grandfather and was picked up by the killers. When they arrive at the farm, they smoke some pot and then Nathan went to work. Adrian's body was now burned beyond recognition. He cut her into seven pieces and placed her in two trash bags. The next step was to hide the bags in different locations. After confessing this much, Corey did lead police to Adrienne's remains. Her torso and legs were found in the woods behind Sarah's grandparents' farm. Her head and arms were placed in a manhole in Black Hawk Park. All that work and weed gave them the munchies, so they went to McDonald's and had a feast. That McDonald's, by the way, was right across from the Taco Bell. At 2 a.m., the phone rang, and Adrienne's father picked up only to hear a parent's worst nightmare, that their child was never coming home. A jury panel of four men and eight women tried the now 17-year-old Sarah Kolb as an adult for two counts of first-degree murder and one count of concealing a homicide. She was given 53 years. Corey Gregory pled guilty to the same crimes and was given 45 years. In 2022, the name Harley Quinn enters the news asking for an appeal for Corey Gregory. Here's why. Cases ...is being resentenced. This morning, we've learned that Corey Gregory is now known as Harley Quinn. She's in the process of a gender reaffirming transition. From here on, we will refer to the former Corey Gregory as Harley Quinn and use she, her pronouns. You know, if I could give my life, I would. I'm sorry, I know it doesn't make a difference. I know you will never forgive me, and I would never ask for it because I do not deserve your forgiveness. And every single day, 
I wish I could bring her back. I, you know, it just, it never leaves me. And the judge ended the, the hearing by saying that your sentence was partially negotiated. The only thing that you could have argued would have been withdrawing your guilty plea 17 years ago. And that was not the case here today. We were trying, they were trying to get a lower sentence. So they reaffirmed the original sentence of 40 years for murder and five years for concealment of a body. Josh, we'll toss it back to you. But the most troubling thing to come out of an already horrifying case was the boy that dismembered the body. He confessed but he kind of slipped through the justice system for his part in all of this because he didn't spend a day in prison. Nathan was given just five years in juvenile detention, and that's it. He was out by the time he was 20. But for Nathan, it was just borrowed time because an angel somewhere was singing for his judgment. And just three years later, his car slammed into a tree burst into flames, and he himself was burned beyond recognition. Need I remind you that Adrienne had the voice of an angel? My name is Killian. Consider hitting the like button to support the video. Hit subscribe to catch future videos. Much love to my Patreons whose support amazes me. Now go protect the ones you love, and love the ones that protect you.